Welcome everyone. This is a talk by Ben Martin on budget CNC machining. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Alrighty, um, pictured here is a relatively new uh, 3040 Chinese CNC machine which you can get off eBay delivered for sort of about $600. Um, comes with a control box which I haven't pictured there. Uh, control box has a, um, basically can run the 200 uh, watt DC motor that's used as a cutter and has three stepper drivers in it and it has a parallel port. So if you're wanting to use the control box that you get, you're going to want to get a parallel port card or an old PC that actually has proper parallel port like the cheaper cards that it's not going to do it because the timing's not okay for that. Um, if you're going to go that way, you can run Linux CNC and control the machine. Um, the way I went, I replaced the control board with something else. So this was my motivation for getting a CNC. Um, I like to play around with robots. So if you're trying to mount these at $10 trolley wheels from Bunnings, and if you're trying to mount those onto a robot, you need to have reasonably precise drill patterns because if you get the wheels wrong then your suspension has a lot more work to do. Uh, uh, you can do it manually, I've made things manually for this, but trying to get things very accurate, which is exactly what you want on wheel mounts, uh, is very hard to do. So in this case I've used MDF to prototype and the first one, number one, and then two, and then three actually expanded it slightly because you get into the trap when you're making things manually of thinking if something's a rectangle it's easier to make and then you realize that you've got this machine that can make curves and it doesn't really matter to it if it's flat or, you know, it's actually much better to make the pattern of three because it saves your fingers. There's always sharp edges if you try and cut rectangles, which you find out pretty quickly is not a great thing. Um, on that, the previous one actually showed, oh yes, right in the center there's a smaller um, clamp hub, which basically you put the, uh, the shaft coming out of an electric motor into that and tighten it down and that gives you the ability to then bolt that to your wheel. Um, they're about five or six bucks from the US and then I sort of thought, hey, I can make those as well. Uh, the downside with that if you're doing a hobby machine is that this particular thing, you've got uh, four or five tool changes. So to cut around the outside of it, you want to have a fairly large milling bit, like a quarter inch mill bit. And the different, the four holes you can see are different to the actual shaft of the motor size. So then you need two different drill bits so you're up to three tool changes and then making the uh, slit that clamps at the top that you can see uh, is actually done with a different thing than the tool below. So there's another tool, so you've got five tools to actually cut this one piece out. So if you're making one of them, then you've got to set aside about you know, two hours to do it. But if you're going to a whole tray, um, which is limited by the 3040 again, that's the actual cut size of the bed. But if you're making a tray of them, you're better to make 12 than to make one because the, the time it takes you to actually put the material down and change your tools dominates. And you might, you know, it's only gonna take it, it may go from like two hours to two hours 20 um, if you're doing 12 instead of one because the machine's quite quick at actually doing what it's doing. Um, there's a lot of people I've seen who are making CNC's themselves, which I, I quite like. Uh, one of the motivations, and I was looking at doing this, the motivation for getting the $600 machine was that the people who are making a CNC themselves with, you know, off the cuff without having played with one, um, you get the rails and you sort of start building the gantry and the axes and things, and you notice like two or three years have gone past, and then you start using it. Whereas if you go and spend $600, um, a week later this big box arrives and, you know, you're, you're straight into it. So in two years' time, you've actually worked out how to do CAD CAM and you're designing your own parts. So in this case, this was a uh, 3D printer, which the software, this is a rep wrap, and the software I really love, but the printer itself, every time I decided to print something, its calibration would be way off because PLA tends to crack and do nasty things. So in this case, the, around the stepper motor, the larger green piece there on the left, um, I'd noticed two cracks, and there's one right next to the stepper, but... Uh, when I took that off, there were actually three bits that were cracked. And since that's the entire structural integrity of the machine, you could see why um, you always had bed, bed leveling issues. So that's the replacement part, which um, again, at first when you start designing parts, you start replicating what you see. And after a while, you sort of start thinking, you yeah, know, it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. But in this case, it's a half inch aluminium, which is almost an exact replication of what was there before. And then that part loaded on. And that changed the way the, the uh, Z-axis was a hell of a lot more rigid to the actual bed. 
and the end game of doing this sort of thing, which only took, you know, you do one part one weekend and one part another weekend, and all the time you're, you're working out how the machine works. You're sort of learning the, the uh, CNC and the CAD CAM side of things, and on the other side you're getting the 3D printer that sort of, you know, uh, you just switch it on and it, it, its calibration is exactly where it was before. So uh, having done the first bracket, I decided to then replace the top piece of plastic. Uh, nothing particularly wrong with it, but a lot of 3D printers designed this side. In this case, you had acrylic, which you can see a slight where the belt is. There's actually a tiny little crack which goes all the way through. And the uh, PLA holding the sides was also cracked. So after a successful replacing of the first piece, Again, half-inch aluminium. Um, this, if you're looking to do aluminium on these 3040s, you're going to have to probably replace the cutter. The 200-watt DC is just not going to do it for you. Uh, so there's sort of two distinct routes to the torque. Um, if you want to just do wood or you want to do acrylic, then the $600 machine will make PCBs. The $600 machine's a great buy. Um, if, on the other hand, you wanted to venture into doing aluminium, you're probably going to want to get a um, water-cooled spindle and a VFD, and that's probably about sort of $400 on top, plus uh, installation, which I'll get to in a minute. So after uh, hideously over-engineering things, and again leads into the um, buy a cheap CNC machine, upgrade the, C the CNC to actually do aluminium, and then just start playing, because in this case, the, the side had been replaced with a half-inch uh, 6061 alloy, and then the belt tensioning system was always one of these horrible, you know, grab the belt, wrench it as fast as you can and sort of slot it in. So um, a quarter inch, um, quarter inch piece on the side with brass screws to offset and saddle clamps. Um, so basically the more you start upgrading on the CNC to make it better, the more you're getting into, the more you operate on the 3D printer, the more you're getting into using the CNC machine. And the more experience you get with it, the more, you know, the more advanced things you can make. So it sort of feeds back quite nicely. And the other side with a, um, a steel mount. Um, the main motivation I had for doing the um, doing CNCing was to build things for robots. So in this case, I wanted to mount a PlayStation 4i to an outside robot to do stereo vision and depth perception. So instead of doing something in PLA, because you've got a robot that's outside and the PLA is going to crack and the sun's going to hit the PLA and melt it and everything, you know, it's just going to go sideways, basically. Um, I just, this is a fairly, uh, a fairly reserved design for, the, for holding the, the camera, uh, but does bolt down tightly and basically nothing is ever going to break it. Um, depending on what, whether robots are your thing or not, you can also make things like um, candle holders and uh, just basically doing, again, getting into, you can do Bezier curves. And I did learn a few things with doing these not necessarily uh, vanilla robotics projects in the CNC because you start pushing the, uh, the cam design and then you'll uncover areas where uh, when it's processing G-code it has little problems and it'll actually nick things out that you would, didn't necessarily want. So it's great to make projects like this that um, you're making because you feel like it, but when you, when you get something that you don't necessarily want or you can't use, um, it's not like you're sort of making a part for a robot and you're really sad about it. You sort of think, oh, there's, there's parts or notches here or, you know, this is actually cut a little bit where I didn't want it to be cut, and you can still, still use it. And again, instead of actually buying or making brackets to hold shelves, um, just making... You know, if you enjoy Meccano, then making M6 nut traps and things like that in aluminium. Um, anyone who's in the Brisbane area, the Edge actually have a full sheet CNC machine. Uh, so this, the sides of this are actually done out of four centimetre thick hardwood, which had been CNC'd there. So if you're there, I highly recommend doing an induction there. And if you want to do CNC, you know, not necessarily buying a CNC at home off the bat, just go along and sort of come up with some designs and you get, get a good sort of feel for it. Um, I understand the Melbourne Hacker Space also have a, a fairly large CNC machine, but I'm not sure um, you know, what state of um, usability that has for Hacker Space members. But, and uh, without having to do any horrible spindle changes, things like this board, um, instead of uh, sending to China and getting a PCB made, if you're doing electronics sort of at a hobby level, um, you know, if you're designing whole boards and things like that, then it's a different ball game. Uh, but if you're, this is sort of, I suppose, I'd classify as a hobby board, uh, 
So when you've got three breadboards and you just want to have through whole components and it's not sort of incredibly complicated, um, instead of sending Gerbers off and then waiting, like if you don't pay for shipping, you have to wait three or four weeks and then a PC board comes back from China. Um, if you've got a 3040 just with a standard spindle and V-card bits, um, you can design something in Gerber in, the, in, in your um, KiCad or in Fritzing or something like that uh, in the morning, export the Gerber files, cut it out in the afternoon, solder it and have the whole project done at the end of the day. So, and then the next day you start working on version two. So even if you're paying 50 bucks for shipping, you're still ahead if you've got one of these machines because you can prototype a lot quicker. Well, I suppose you could move to Shenzhen, do it there and come back, but you know, it's probably cheaper to buy a $600 machine. I found the, the three most effective tools you're going to need with a CNC machine are a great light, a big magnifying glass and good sets of tweezers because you're bound to get chunks of aluminium embedded in your skin where you don't want them. <laughs> If it's wood, you have that feeling like it'll break down over time, but if it's stainless steel or aluminium, you sort of, you know, you've got a companion for life unless you dig him out. Um, if you're looking to do aluminium, I highly recommend building something like this, a nice little sort of enclosure for your new pet. Um, any gaps that you put in around the doors, you can sort of see on the acrylic base, that's six mil acrylic at the front, which was sort of my attempt to do, you know, this will stop something from flying at me, ha, ha, ha. Um, but it, there was a slight sort of gap there and things would bounce and come up through that gap at the front. So then you'd get chips of aluminium coming at you. And even at the door hinges, basically anywhere that there is an air gap, the machine will find that air gap and give you wonderful little showers of snow globe. Uh, the best place for viewing the CNC is not in the room. Um, initially, it's lots of fun looking through that acrylic window and seeing the little pieces flying away. But then if you start mounting cameras at the top and uh, near the spindle, that black droopy thing is actually a little endoscopic camera, which I've mounted as close to the cutting head as I can. So there's no way you would want to put your head in that position. But you get a great view. And you know, it's the safety thing. If you're cutting uh, 6061 in a profile cut at 24,000 RPM, it is loud. Um, so being outside the room, if, you're in, if you have it in your garage, for example, anywhere in the house, people know that you're doing it. Like, it's not, you know, oh, please stop so I can watch telly, but it's, oh, he's, he's running that again. So, yes, yeah, not in the room. Um, two sets of earmuffs are always good, too, but... Uh, uh, the, what can the 3040 do? This is the main, main thing. PCB, wood, a uh, little bit of scratching. If you've got one mil aluminium, you can probably get through it with a good cutting bit if you don't upgrade the spindle. Uh, but if you... If you do want to do aluminium, I would highly recommend changing the spindle that comes with it, basically. But wood's great. I mean, you get a piece of pine and you can make things out of the pine and get the CAD-CAM stuff happening. For people who, uh, as I was, you know, everyone starts in the same place, uh, unfamiliar with CNCing, I thought I'd take a photo of a few, um, a few of the bits. In the blue plastic holder is a ball-ended ball cutting bit. And the uh, collette, which holds the bits, is in the middle. So you're going to want a set of collettes uh, for each. Basically, they range from millimetres, so five to six mil, six to seven, et cetera. And they screw down with a collette nut in the end of the spindle. Uh, investing in a set of shorter drill bits, because if you, especially with a 3040, if you go and you whip off to Bunnings and buy a whole set of drill bits, uh, it may not be as great as you think because the actual area, you get 55 mil of Z travel with a 3040. And if you've got a job a bit or a standard sort of size drill bit, you're actually taking up a fair amount of that space. Whereas if you've got the shorter bit, you have more ability, you have more flexibility with what you're doing. Um, you, they're not hard to get the shorter bits, but you, you're not going to be able to probably just walk into Bunnings and get them. And where do you go from the just a vanilla 3040? I've already mentioned a few times um, upgrading to, to do aluminium. Uh, the upgrade that I'm still sort of halfway through doing um, is to modify the z-axis. So instead of 55 mil of travel, I'll get 160 mil of travel. And with 160 mil of travel, I want to then like stretch the whole gantry up 100 millimeters. So at the moment, um, the bottom of the gantry is 80 millimeters high above the table. So if you try and put a vise in there to hold your workpiece, it's not going to really work because you're just not going to have the clearance between table, vise, workpiece, cutting piece hanging out of the, the spindle. So depending on, I mean, again, if you can afford a more expensive machine to start with, then that's great. 
Um, but if you've got a 3040, you can sort of know what you're doing and you get to a, point, a pain point where you say, I want to do this or I want to have a fourth axis now. And the fourth axis, if you get a reasonable one, is 120 mil high. So then you want to try and put that under the gantry because you've got a limited cutting area. So if the actual mechanics of the fourth axis are under the gantry, you're not wasting cutting space by having it sort of on the other side. And fourth and fifth axis. So that's on the top, although sort of, well, it's not too bad against on the screen. The top one is the spindle you get with a thir uh, normal 3040. And the bottom spindle is what you can upgrade to, which is uh, um, basically 2.2 kilowatt spindle, um, three phase, uh, water cooled. And the difference in weight, I think the other one, the top one might be half a kilo and the bottom one's probably seven or eight kilos. Um, I did rudimentary testing as well before I did this. I thought I'll get seven or eight kilograms of weight and put it on the gantry and try and move it to make sure all the stepper motors still move properly. So they do. And interesting, it's probably one of the few tips. You know, it will handle the weight. So you can do this upgrade and get away with it. This was the, the biggest uh, moment during the upgrade, if you like. Um, because the, the standard spindle is a lot smaller and you can buy for about 30 bucks these aluminium uh, spindle holders, but then you need to try and sort of you know, shove them onto the existing machine. And the only way I could think of easily doing that was to cut the original spindle holder. And as soon as you do that, you can no longer use the machine unless, you, you know, unless the upgrade is successful. Uh, so I had all these sort of things from forums about tramming and stuff where you, you get uh, the z-axis like that and you have mounted the spindle slightly off or you've mounted it this way slightly off. And if you're a professional machinist, you would probably come around and see what I've done and then vomit and then come back and measure it and say, you're, you know, you're out by half a millimeter in this dimension or that dimension. But for what I'm doing, the rigidity of the machine is not such that you would really notice that. Because if you're cutting aluminium, the tool deflection off the aluminium and if you're drilling an M6 hole on a machine like this, even with the spindle upgrade, you'd have the gantry and you'd have the spindle and you can noticeably see the whole spindle rocking as you're drilling, even if you're only drilling one millimetre and backing off and drilling one millimetre. So um, from a professional machinist's point of view, it's not, you know, it's just a toy. Uh, because if, you're, if you've got that sort of flexibility in the machine, then they'd say, like, you know, I can't do anything with it. But you can still make quite useful robotic parts with this. So, and again, for the money, it's uh, for bang for the buck, it's great, great stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just basically got a relatively flat piece of aluminium, cut the other thing off, flattened it down, put the actual, well, it was a one day sort of transition from the old spindle to the new spindle and then the cabling and everything else. But, um, yeah, this, this upgrade works reasonably well. Um, didn't have any major issues with it. Um, as I say, the alignment, I tried to align it as well as I could, but I didn't sort of align it at a, you know, a proper grinding sort of machinist level and it still works fine afterwards. Uh, if you're doing aluminium, solid bill cutting oil is great. Um, I have actually got a mister, but I've also then read up on what that does. So if you're throwing solid bill cutting oil through tubes with compressed air and it blows it at the cutting head, but the only downside is you've then got solid bill cutting oil in really fine mist in atmosphere, which your lungs don't tend to appreciate. Uh, and I'm not sure what the longer term health effects of that are, but I've sort of I've stuck with the water spray bottle because it tends to have more of a liquid form than a gas form, which, you know, keeping it all inside that box is great. And, you know, it's, it can get a bit gassy, like you can sort of get a bit cloudy in the box if you're using too much cutting oil. The downside, though, is if you don't use cutting oil, the tool that you're using to cut with will just heat up, so your tool life will go down. So a lot of these things, like, you know, on the budget side, um, uh, when I'm running my drill bits, I run them at a faster RPM than they're rated for. Uh, so they are going to heat up, and I'm, then, uh, I'm cutting smaller chips with the drill bits, uh, and they're heating up. I'm getting less tool life out of them, but I'm paying a dollar per drill bit. So, you know, you buy cheaper bits, and a lot of things, your tool life goes down if you don't do it properly, but as long as it's still safe, I think, you know, if, if, it's, if it doesn't hurt anyone and it's safe, and you don't break anything and throw metal across the room, um, yeah, works for me. If you do, uh, I've got a cyclonic filter and a vacuum underneath, and if you do upgrade the VFD, you're going to need to have a, a pit of water and a water pump. So it, it, it's a decision not to be taken lightly, um, trying to mill aluminium, because you need to have all of these ancillary things sitting around and the space for them and sort of maintaining them. <laughs> 
So it becomes not just that large box with the machine, large box with the machine, sort of size underneath for water and for vacuum. I mean, you're probably going to want vacuum anyway, but with wood it doesn't really matter. If you've got these really sharp pieces of aluminium that are sort of snow globing the whole thing, you're going to want to be able to get rid of them. I had initially thought in the talk to uh, whether I would delve into doing CAD and CAM and things like that, and here's free CAD, here's me opening it, doing, setting up pockets and profiles and how you do drilling. But I thought with the people in here are probably, you know, the software side, if I mention what the software is, you're probably going to be able to determine which one you're going to want to use anyway. Uh, so, you know, for, from the CAM point of view, uh, the, main th the main things you're going to need to do there are uh, working out what cutting pieces you've got and placing them in the library and whatever software you've got. Uh, and the exporting the G-code, I haven't actually found anything that will export properly to Smoothie Board, so you may have to tweak the G-code exporter a little bit. And the actual execution of the G-code, if you go Linux CNC, you just need a Linux machine that's attached via parallel to whatever controller you've got. And if you go smoothie board, you just upload to the smoothie board and use various other hacks to actually control the machine. So that's what FreeCAD looks like. Um, you can use, uh, you know, I'd recommend FreeCAD. Um, if, you're, if you do design and you use Blender, there's a CAM module for Blender. So basically with the CAD, you, you, you're building a model such as this without the green lines. And in CAM, you're actually laying tool parts in. You're saying, I've got a quarter inch end mill and I want to run it all the way around here. Or I want to run in a helix to make a hole that's 12 mil wide. Uh, you're basically designing where your tools are going to go, uh, what tools you've got, what order they're going to go in, and how they're going to operate. And from after the CAM, you need to export the G-code, which is sort of, well, most people have seen G-code from 3D printing, but you know, instructions to move cutting head here and there and turn on and off things. Uh, first, uh, I did the bottom bit's actually bought rather than uh, milled. Um, to get anything like that bottom part, I think I'd need to have a, a proper five axis setup, and I'm not there yet. If you're using another tool you can use for doing a CAD CAMs, Fusion 360, which at the moment um, they have a, an option that you can download it and use it free if you're making less than 100,000 uh, a year on it. So I sort of posit that if I was making over 100000 a year, I wouldn't mind giving them money. But, you know, uh, it's closed source, but uh, it depends on which battles you want to pick. Um, if you want to stick fully with GPL stuff, that's a, a viable route. Um, if you want to play around with Fusion, then it's sort of, you know, not available at no cost. In this case, the previous thing I actually made in Fusion, because um, I was playing around with ball and toolpaths and working out how to get it to... Um, to make the tool pass I was after. The controller box I replaced with this, which is a knockoff of the smoothie board, which you can get uh, for about 50 US dollars. So you have, in this case, five stepper controllers, and you can short circuit the stepper controllers and run your own steppers if you want. Um, network, SD card, um, it will do um, 3D printers, so you have MOSFETs and stuff to turn on and off heaters and hotbeds and things like that, which you're not going to use for for CNC stuff, um, and end stops. You've got six end stops for X, Y, Z, min, max. Which I think, basically, I'm just saying the exact same thing. Uh, when you get the smoothie board, setting it up, and setting up most CNC machines, um, because it's all pretty arbitrary whether you, whether you choose moving the gantry across as being your x-axis, or whether you choose moving that way and the gantry as being your x-axis. So the way basically I ended up doing it was putting it in front of me and having X grow uh, in a positive way toward the right and Y away from me and Z being up down. Like whatever, whatever is going to cause you not to have to think what's X, Y, and Z. And if you look at it, um, you can s select what steppers are X, Y. Um, the main thing with stepper motors that kills them is heat. So if you run too many amps through the stepper motor, the coil heats up and they die. So voltage is not as essential. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to try and run thousands of volts through them, but um, 15, 50 volts. Uh, so that's, and calibration, I actually had it slightly under calibrated, and then I ran a huge job that was right off the edge of the bed and noticed that it was about half a millimetre off calibration when it travelled over the entire distance. 
So in that case, you're basically telling the machine how many steps per millimeter you need to run the stepper at to actually move the cutting head one millimeter, and then you can um, tell it how fast you want it to go overall. So how many millimeters per minute you want to travel, how quickly to accelerate to that speed. Um, and that's one of those things, especially with that, where you need to sort of play around so that it's not, uh, you're not trying to run the steppers too fast or things like that. So you're probably going to spend a good day or two getting reasonable calibration. Uh, making PC boards on the 3040, and this can be done basically if you get a V-carve bit and a $600 machine with no spindle upgrades or any sort of nasties. Uh, that's the smallest components that I can do. If you're doing through-hole stuff, it's all great. Um, you can get small drill bits, 0.8, one millimeter, um, make all your dip sockets, make all your resistor cap sockets, and any, any holes in it. I mean, vias are a problem because you're basically drilling through and then you have to go back and solder on both sides to make the via manually. Um, SOIC chips like this one, this is one of the, uh, where it was, yes, the MCP23017, so it's an I2C 16, 16 port GPIO over I2C. Um, the pin spacing on those from pin to pin is about, I think, 1.27 millimetres. Um, the 328 chips, I think I actually have that coming along anyway. Um, so I won't get ahead of myself. So if you're wanting to do this, you're not going to use your, uh, your uh, free cut and things like that. Um, flat cam is the package to go for. And it basically takes Gerber files. And there's a few little tricks to getting it going the first time. Um, because you, if you don't flip it over, like you have the Gerber file and you think that's great, I'll just like put that onto the uh, copper laminate board and cut it straight away. But you're actually wanting to cut the bottom side. So you need to import the Gerber file and flip it over and have the copper laminate facing downwards in the end result. So flipping it over and to a diameter of uh, 0.012 inches, uh, which I think is about 0.3 millimetres. Um, 0.012, well, 12 thousandths of an inch, 0.3 millimetres. Um, after you've loaded Gerber files, you need to open the Excelion to actually get the drills. And you can uh, decide to take 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and actually, again, because every time you have to change a drill bit, you have to actually stop the machine and if you're cautious about it, turn everything off so that the spindle won't possibly turn on accidentally and cut you when you're doing this, which I, I recommend turning everything off. Um, but if you're having to do four drill bit changes and then actually cut to go to the V-carve, you, you're better off to try and sort of have, get away with having larger drill holes if you can. So then you've only got two or three tool changes. I found too that uh, every time I've been using flat cam, it's wanted to have a fairly conservative uh, cutting speed, which the first board I did took like an hour to do. So I manually up the, um, the cutting feed by just sort of forcing that in the first of the G-code things. And in flat cam, X and Y are the bottom left of the board, which is another handy little tip because you need to calibrate and move and home the machine at the bottom left of the board. Uh, otherwise, it'll try and cut the board off the other side of the the copper laminate, which doesn't work incredibly well. Um, the QF, QFP, uh, as I was sort of getting to, and then I remembered that it was coming up in these slides, um, the smaller chip uh, on there was a SOEC, which is 1.27 pin pitch, and the QFP, I think, is about a 0.8 pin pitch, and the pins themselves are about, I think, 0.3 or 0.4 millimetres. So it doesn't seem that bad, but then when you take the pin off there, it's like about half the, the size you've got to play with. And I found that the cheaper boards I was getting, uh, the board itself, the copper laminate's nowhere near flat. So then you set your V-carve bit to be slightly below to guarantee that you're not going to have copper contact where you don't want it. But then the actual size of the cutting area that you're doing is no longer you know, exactly 0.3 millimetres. You're up to like 0.4 or 0.5 in places. So then you find that the actual copper you were supposed to have left behind is, is in, in places is too fine. Um, the copper also tears out, which I haven't tracked down, whether running the spindle faster or slower, like the actual sweet spot for not actually having, you know, having the thing bring copper from both sides into the cut and just ripping it out, which makes really, really fine detailed cutting very hard to do, and also getting higher micro steps. Uh, the 3040 I got, which doesn't have ball screws, this may also be a limiting issue. So if you're doing, um, if you want to do smaller boards, SOEX and things like that, and through hole components, just, you know, the cheaper ball screws, they're fine. Uh, but if you want to try and get 
finer detail, I'd probably look at spending a couple of hundred bucks more to get good ball screws if you, when you're buying the machine, if you're buying it for PCB making. So I was thinking uh, when I was looking at the smoothie board that it would have an interface, a web interface, being a Cortex M based board like the RepRap Pro and things like that, which is a really slick sort of uh, web interface and lets you control the machine and uh, send jobs and see what things are doing. And the smoothie board's interface is sort of not quite at that level. Um, you sort of have a, a web uh, HTML version of the printer face to move the cutting head around, which works OK on a 3D printer. But when you have a Miller machine and you have one right next to a 10 graduation move in the next direction, and you're right next to the edge, you really don't want to sit there with your phone and accidentally sort of hope you get the one rather than the 10. So I started playing around with using MQTT for that. And this controller basically just sends MQTT messages when you click on any of the 12 buttons. And on the other end, I have a, uh, I'm using MQTT launcher to listen to all of those buttons and to send G code to the machine. So that way, you've got physical buttons that you can press, and you'd no longer crash the bed. You no longer press, like, you know, drop the Z height 10 millimeters and sort of race over and switch the power off on the stepper motors. Um, and the other trick there is if you're using flat cam, it defaults to not metric. So if you have things set up to do things and send G code for movements, if you don't wrap that in a G21, um, you press to go down one millimeter and it goes down one inch and bad things happen. So there's also in G code relative and absolute movement. So that's what the G91 is all about. So instead of saying go to x of five, I'm just saying relatively move five units or five millimeters in the x dimension in metric. So that worked out reasonably well. And then I decided to do something about the web interface. Um, so you know, being a software guy, over engineering just wasn't a word in the vocabulary. Um, I, uh, first, I tried to actually put MQTT on the microcontroller, which there is a micro MQTT library to run on there. But it's also very, the micro itself is very con constrained for RAM. Uh, so I wound up uh, using a Raspberry Pi and running, a, um, running two connections. Uh, one connection, if you, you send a get pause command, which translates to G code, and it says, here's my X, Y, and Z location. But if you are running a job and you send one of those, it can take a few seconds to get a response back, which is fine. But if you've got something uh, sitting on a Raspberry Pi polling that, and if you get about five requests, the smoothie board crashes. So halfway through your job, it just stops and sits there. So you get uh, fun and games for doing this. But in the end, you, you can actually make a reasonably nice web interface. Um, you can put MQTT over web sockets. So you can build a nice bootstrap clown suit sitting there and sending these MQTT messages back. So in this case, I get to see how far through the job it is, what the X, Y, and Z components are. And instead of having the, uh, like the interface interface of moving, I actually have explicit dimensions. So you can say, I'm moving 10 millimeters. And when I click X, that's what's going to happen. Not I click X, and maybe I move 1 or 10. Or you know, I'll see what happens sort of clicking. Uh, in in G-Code itself, there's, and if you're doing batches, this is kind of handy. Uh, there's support for having multiple offsets. So you can have six jobs. You have a large sheet. And you have one job that's only about that large. And you can actually you can offset to six different locations as being your origin. So you can start the same job in different origins and cut out six lots of the same job uh, from six different origins on a, on a single sheet of aluminum or, or wood or whatever you're cutting with. Uh, the two cameras I've got at the moment, the first shot that you had seen before was the um, native Raspberry Pi camera, which I've tried and tried to get. Um, I have it sort of working, um, sending the images at the moment. That half the screen goes to purple junk every now and then. Uh, but if you can wrap it properly, um, you can decode it with any of the stuff on the phone. Aha, uh -huh, excellent. <laughs> I, uh, well, I knew I was doing something bad using the dot slash test launch. Like when you're sort of having to go to that level, I thought maybe there's better ways of actually syncing that video. But if you sync it properly, the phones can decode it in hardware. If you don't, then, you know, so that makes it a lot easier to stand outside the room with your phone in your hand and look at the camera. 
Uh, that's the aforementioned uh, endoscopic cam, which I think was about $40 from the, the Evos and places like that. So uh, again, I highly recommend that because it's hard to see and it's dangerous as well. If you're getting your head right next to the glass to try and get a good look at where the cutting edge is and you're cutting aluminium, and all it has to do is really bind to the aluminium and cut the carbide tool and throw it at the acrylic and you sort of have to test whether the acrylic's gonna be strong enough to stop that hitting you. Whereas if you can look at a small camera that's mounted that far away from the cutter, you know, if it breaks loose and hits the camera, you just order another camera. So I'm a big fan of ordering other cameras and not being anywhere near this thing when it's running. <laughs> Um, eventually you come to the point where you decide that uh, you're going to rip the gantry off this thing and the, the gantry, and this is a great example of what you get for the $600, the two side parts of the gantry are half inch aluminium in this, so they are actually fairly beefy even though you can flex when you're drilling M6 holes in aluminium. And it looks surprisingly clean in that shot so I thought I'd sort of dispel the illusion. Uh, there's part that I haven't vacuumed and wiped down yet. And it's another interesting point because this thing's been running and done a number of jobs and there's nothing, you, normally you get a vinyl sort of accordion which will sit over your lead screws to protect them from crap getting in there and in this case there's been, the machine doesn't come with anything like that for the Z and it still works and it still hasn't gunked up all of the bearings. So, you know, it's, it's a design deficiency but it's not something that bites you immediately. So it's, it sort of goes with the whole thing of a 3040 is a great machine and when you break it, you can sort of think, you know, now do I get a bigger one or do I fix it? Rather than sort of, oh, I've got to start with a, you know, I've got to go and buy a Tormac or something like that, which is a, you know, another valid choice. But not everyone wants to spend 10 or 20 grand on a CNC. So, having said that, uh, <laughs> this is the uh, Z-axis to replace the, uh, the current one. Um, so there's 100, uh, I started out with a little over 160 mil of travel and there were some deficiencies. I have a video explaining in great detail the, the joys of building this. Um, but the big takeaway that I have, because as soon as you've built something, you find the main deficiency is really obvious to you. And a lot of videos do it, but the end bearing on the top left, if you have the rails actually going past that end bearing, because the part where you're mounting the spindle has a, a noticeable size. So you want the rails to be longer than the ball screw basically. So if your ball screw is 300 mil, you make your rails 450. And you can always limit it to not go to the end of the rails, but then you'd get closer to the 300 that the ball screw can do. Because in this case, the ball screw is 300 mil, but the two bearings on each side and the plate that's on it are going to take up about half of that 300 mil because it can't move past the end of the ball screw. Um, one of the reasons that this is a bit hard to do in rebuilding, which is why I sort of went the route of buying a 3040 rather than trying to build from scratch is there's so many things that bite you like it sort of seems oh I'll just put some rails down put the lead screw down you're great uh, but then you look at it and you try and make the rails as close together as you can because if the further apart they are when you mount it on the gantry you lose that travel space in the gantry so then you mount them closer and then you want to put limit switches in and you want to try and make sure that they actually still fit so I can understand why it takes people years to build design and build a CNC from scratch um, but the years that you may want to spend using the CNC rather than trying to get the CNC to work. And these little blue inductive switches sort of wedged in the middle part there, um, they run about 12, 15 volts and pick up metal at about six millimeters away. They're a wonderful little thing as far as the interactions between electricity and magnetism. Uh, they work on alloy as well, but not as well. So you get maybe three or four millimetres away. So on the other side, I've actually mounted a small steel bracket on the underside of the spindle cover so that it picks up that steel bracket moving in. But the whole point here, and this is the most likely place that you'll crash a 3040, uh, 55 millimetres of Z travel. You've really got to watch it because a lot of CAD programs will say, you know, your timber, timber's here, cutter's here, and now when I'm moving, I'm going to lift off 20 millimetres and then move over here. And then when you start the job, you think that's great, but then you notice that the Z height, it's hit the top of the Z axis and it's this sort of, the servo is grinding against the, the top and the whole calibration in your Z axis is gone and bad things happen. So that's the need to replace it, but also that's one of the areas if you're doing anything with wood with a 3040, you want to make sure that um, you're not going to top, hit the top or the bottom of that 55 mil. So it's great if you've got flat pieces of wood, but if you're trying to use a vice or whatever, the clearances and stuff are just not, uh, yeah, 
It goes with the, uh, the general flavour of it. If you buy a 3040, you can do interesting things, but you will find the pain points, and that's, that's certainly one of them. And then eventually you start looking at the, um, putting a fourth axis on them, which some of the more uh, upper market, like the 6040 and the larger Chinese CNCs, if you don't go 3040, you spend like two or three grand getting a larger scale one. Some of those will come with a fourth axis. Um, this particular one, in between the stepper motor and the vice at the front, you're running a 100 to 1 harmonic drive, so you can get 150 foot-pounds of holding torque, which is quite handy when you're trying to slice bits of aluminium and you don't want it to move. Um, some of the homemade ones I've seen are using motorbike disc brakes, so you rotate to where, you, where you're going to and then you interlock the disc brake to actually stop it, and then you can mill a piece and then rotate it and stop it again. But I think 150 foot-pounds is enough for me. Um, the smoothie board can do five axis if you get the right board. I've got one that can do five, but you have to recompile the firmware, which it's not really that hard, like it's 20 minutes work, but then, you know, if you have to change one configuration setting, download an entire compile environment to do it, it's sort of a bit annoying that there's not a five axis build, I guess. Um, the fifth axis, I've heard a lot of stuff with people, like initially everyone says, I'd love to do five axis milling, so you've got the rotation part You've got the X, Y, Z part, and then on top of the rotation part that goes like that, you have another rotation going like that. In which case, you can do fun things like make little figurines, cut out, you know, get precision cutting bits and make a little Buddha out of metal. Um, you know, make Baroque furniture. But the problem is that they're a little bit harder to control. Like people sort of say the fifth axis doesn't add one axis, it adds like 50 axes of complexity. Um, I have found a, a great example of why you would want to get one. Um, if you're trying to do a chamfer, you can get chamfer bits at 45 or 30 degrees and then just knock the edges off a square. But if you have a fifth axis, you can actually rotate it and use a standard milling bit and chamfer it at any angle you like, all the way around. And the tool paths are not that hard to do for a five axis chamfer. So it sort of leads into, you know, here's something you can do that's quite complex, uh, but you get something out of it immediately, which is the 3040 philosophy. You know, what's the what's something useful that I can do by having a fifth axis, rather than I'd like to cut this, in, no, I'd like all these chess pieces that I haven't designed yet that are magically going to materialise, and then it never happens. Um, so, my wrap up, because so I'm getting brilliantly timed. Uh, the native 3040, if you do nothing, you can do PCBs and wood quite happily. I am assuming acrylic, I haven't done much acrylic on it. Um, because my motivation for it was always to make robot parts, so I was always leaning towards chucking half the machine away and making you know, upgrades and bigger spindles and things like that so I could do that. Um, the biggest problem if you're doing alloy even with an upgraded thing is M6 holes. If you're doing drilling M4 and you peck drill, one mil, retract, one mil again, retract, you're fine. If you're doing M5, it's sort of okay, the rigidity's not bad. If you hit M6, you're in trouble. Um, if you run your drill bits at five or 6,000 RPM, your life of your drill bit goes down, but you don't flex the gantry as much, so it's a trade-off that I sort of tend to make. And if you're running M8 holes, then it's no problem at all, because you use a quarter-inch drill bit and helix down. So you'd never, you know, I would never put a, an 8 mil drill bit into this thing, because I know it wouldn't like it, and there's better ways of doing it. Um, if you're doing it uh, alloy, 6061 at 24,000 RPM with the VFD is quite loud, and I made the mistake of running at 18k RPM. Slightly, drill, slightly dull um, tungsten carbide bit, 18,000 RPM, starts to rub the aluminium rather than cut it, heats up, breaks the mill bit, so I, I would not recommend doing that. In the future, I think any dull bits I'll just save for wood, which my woodworking friends would love that comment. Just, like, turn away. So anytime anyone has questions or wants to talk about CNC, I don't know we have a heap of time, but um, you can also come and harass me whenever you see me. I'm very happy to talk. Thank you. Um, are the separate motor drivers on the smoothie board sufficient or are you using external drivers? Um, I'm using the ones that are on there at the moment, which are only 16 or 32 micro steps and they're limited to two amps. <coughs> So I was looking to upgrade. There's some boards you can get uh, from the China sources which have huge heat sinks, 128 micro steps, and they'll do up to 50 volts. So again, you can run, I was sort of mentioned with the voltage thing, if you're at the moment, I'm running them at 15 volts at two amps, but I gain three times the amount of torque if I jack the voltage up.
But I do think that running more than 50 volts DC becomes interesting from a health point of view. <laughs> I understand it can actually bridge over you at like 100 volts DC. So, but I can come and talk to you about that. You've spoken about the z-axis size, but what's the bed size? What's the area that it can cover? Okay. And yep. what's the precision when cutting, let's say, laminated wood or MDF? Um, the 3040 actually gives away the size. I think it's meant to be 30 centimeters by 40, um, but that's sort of the, the Chinese 30 by 40, if you like. Um, you're not going to get that. You sort of bank more on like 25 by 30 or 25 by 35. Um, if you upgrade the spindle, you sacrifice a bit of Y dimension. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're actually over time. Unfortunately, we're out of time. A big round of applause for Ben, please.